Good evening and welcome to Heterodox Academy. For those of you tuning in for the first time, I'm Kyle Vitale, Director of Programs here at HXA, and I'll be briefly introducing the evening and our speaker. Just a quick note that because we're in a Zoom room and not a webinar, we very much appreciate you keeping your mics muted. We like to keep these spotlights a bit more organic, so there will be an open question period later, uh, but we appreciate your attention to mic etiquette in the meantime, as the first part of this event uh, is recorded. And speaking of, hello to our viewers watching this later through our YouTube channel. We're glad you came to our channel and are, are listening in. If you are new to HXA's work, Heterox Academy is a nonpartisan nonprofit committed to improving research and education by increasing open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement in higher education. We have more than 5,000 members from institutions across the country and around the globe. If you're interested in our community, our resources, exclusive events, and programs, it is free to join. And you can visit heterodoxacademy.com or sorry, org slash join to learn more. Our theme this fall to get to this evening has been higher education in an ailing republic. How can teaching, writing, research, and campus life contribute to improving our democracy and improve itself for the sake of our democracy? Uh, our speaker and her research tonight has some answers. Tonight's event will be in two parts. The first will be our speaker address. This will be recorded for our YouTube channel, so we strongly encourage you again to keep mics off if you're just joining us. Part two will be live, unrecorded Q&A with our speaker. We'll invite questions via Zoom's raise hand function or just by typing into the chat. Feel free to do that. I'll be monitoring that. As always, this is HXA, so we encourage challenging, authentic questions as long as they're asked in good faith and constructively. Now, finally, I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Lindsay Hoffman, PhD, joined the faculty of the Department of Communication at the University of Delaware in September 2007 after receiving her PhD from The Ohio State University. Her research examines, among other things, how citizens use internet technology to become engaged with politics in their communities. Dr. Hoffman holds a joint appointment in the Department of Political Science and International Relations and is the Associate Director of the Center for Political Communication. She's also the Director of the Annual National Agenda Speaker Series. She teaches courses in political communication, politics and technology, media effects, and research methods. Lindsay is also a recipient of HXA FFO funding and has been doing some great work at UD, uh, and we're going to hear about that now. So, Lindsay, I will pass it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction, um, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I'm discovering about this community, not just H HXA, but the broader community of higher educators who, people in higher education who are trying to do this important work on college campuses is we need to share methods and, and practices so that we can do better um, together. So uh, we can all benefit from each other's experience. So I'm going to uh, do a slideshow. I'm gonna share my screen. So give me just a minute here. Hang on just a moment till I get this set up. Okay, Kyle, can you confirm that that looks okay? Looks great to me. Okay, well, I'm of course at the last slide, so I need to go, all right, let me get out of this and go to the beginning. <laughs> that's good. If you wanna go full slideshow, that's fine because we can see some of your, your tabs, but you know, it, it's totally visible. Okay. So. so you can see tabs, but that's okay. Looks fine to me. All right. Um, okay, great. So uh, I appreciate this opportunity and thank you, Kyle, for um, asking uh, me to do this uh, presentation today. Um, I have been uh, a member of Heterodox Academy, I believe since 2018 or 19. And um, it was a real, it was really exciting for me to find HXA because I've been using Jonathan Haidt's work so much in my classroom. Um, and particularly around the um, the Righteous Mind uh, book. And it was really fun to kind of see and meet with other people who come from a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of different perspectives about how do we get students to learn how to communicate effectively across difference. So uh, I wanna talk today about getting students invested in campus dialogue and specifically 
how do you research that engagement once you get them invested? Uh, and I'm really going to emphasize throughout the talk the importance of student involvement on the back end. So in other words, getting students in my classroom, students who are doing undergraduate research, students who are doing graduate research to buy into the fact that, um, that this is an exciting area of research to engage in. So uh, thank you for the introduction. I'll go ahead and get started. So let's look at where we are. Uh, most Americans think that, that the direction of higher education is in going in the wrong direction. Uh, when you look at Republicans versus Democrats, this is from Pew Research uh, from 2018. This is before COVID, uh, where a lot of Republicans are saying that, that higher education in the US is going in the wrong direction. Even a majority of Democrats and Democratic leaners are saying this is going in the wrong direction large partisan gaps in reasons why it's headed in the wrong direction. So you look at uh, tuition costs are too high, Democrats and Republicans both agreeing there, students are not getting the skills that they need, majorities again on both sides of the, the partisan line. But when it comes to concerns around ideological issues and partisan issues, Republicans and Democrats differ dramatically in their concerns about protecting students from, view, from views they might find offensive and whether professors are bringing their political and social views into the classroom. Massive gaps between these two partisan groups. There are significant age gaps among Republicans specifically. Older Republicans are much more likely than the younger counterparts to point to ideological factors. So 96 are Republicans age 65 and older who think higher education is headed in the wrong direction say that's because professors are bringing their views into the classroom. And only 58% of Republicans aged 18 to 34 share that view. So there are a lot of age differences, but the important thing to understand is that this is the environment that students are coming into. When they're, when they're going to college, they're coming you know, in this uh, very highly divided time in our country. Um, this is what they're coming into. This is what they're hearing from their parents, from their families. And um, this is what we have to deal with as educators is that they're coming in thinking, wow, things are really messed up and they're having really divisive views. So a little background on me. Um, I have been doing a speaker series, as Kyle mentioned, since I took it over in 2015. It's been, we've been doing it since 2010. Um, and I've always appreciated bringing in people from different backgrounds and different uh, partisan positions, as well as people who can talk to us about how to engage in conversation in more impactful ways. So this picture is uh, of uh, a, picture, speech, a speaker I had this year um, uh, who was the uh, CEO and founder of the Listen First Project, uh, Pierce Godwin. And uh, this is one thing that we do on UD's campus to help students learn how to engage across difference. Show them that there are people that come in who, you know, this was a, a former Republican who uh, saw that people weren't communicating effectively and created this new project called the Listen First Project. And there are a lot of organizations like this. Listen First is one. Uh, Living Room Conversations are another great outlet for engaging in, in conversations across difference about lots of difficult issues. And there are also online versions of these things like the Perspectives uh, uh, platform from the Constructive Dialogue Institute, formerly known as uh, Open Mind. Um, as well as uh, a recently adopted platform at here at UD called Issue Voter, where after students are registered to vote and after they vote, they can sign up for which issues they care about the most and be able to hold their representatives accountable. But at the same time, as we try to do this work to engage with students across differences, for example, in 2017, I brought in a relatively well-known University of Delaware alum, Joe Biden, along with uh, a former a Republican governor of Ohio, John Kasich. And this was 2017. And I was kind of alarmed that my students were shocked at the fact that they could get along with each other, that they could have a conversation with each other, a friendly conversation. Um, so we're having these kinds of conversations here at University of Delaware. But at the same time, we're also seeing student groups invite controversial speakers, provocative speakers, uh, like, for example, Jack Posobiec uh, speaking with Michael Knowles to a group of students on campus uh, as part of the Turning Point USA student group. Um, this, these are speakers who are brought to campus to sort of challenge existing status quo or perceived status quo around free speech on college campuses. Uh, this particular event 
seated about 650 students in, in the hall and it was completely full. There was a smaller protest outside, uh, but as far as I saw, I didn't see the students engaging with each other, the protests and the supporters. Um, last night, we actually had another uh, Turning Point USA student-sponsored debate uh, with Lily Kate and Kai Schwemmer. Uh, these are both uh, open, uh, outspoken conservative uh, pundits, young folks who are leading voices of Generation Z on conservatism and Christianity. This was held in a classroom at UD, and, and I have uh, just an account from one of my students who attended. Uh, this was a smaller event uh, because it was in a classroom, and the students protesting actually did engage in the Q&A at the event as well, so we're seeing a very different um, interaction than we saw in the previous event. So uh, the point here is that we're seeing students engaging in lots of different types of political speech on their campuses. And these are often very local to the geography of the region that you're in, or um, simply the, the political makeup of the university that you're at. So one thing that I'm, I'm going to, again, bring up over and over again tonight is, is taking advantage of, not taking advantage of, utilizing students in your classes and in your research programs to conduct research, independent research, to help them understand the nature of what's happening on our campus, as well as to help me understand what's happening with that. So this next slide is from fresh off the, the presses yesterday. My students gave some of their final presentations for their class uh, in National Agenda, which is the speaker series. And this group did a content analysis of a variety of student organizations, as well as other University of Delaware organizations, and how they were using social media to publicize events about political, publicize political events on campus. So this is a slide straight from their show. This was, uh, again, this debate that occurred last night. And they looked at what kinds of uh, social media posts that did these groups present. Um, and so th the point of is, is that where am I going with all of this? Uh, I'm talking about what's happening at UD's campus this semester. Isn't this program supposed to be about recruiting students to participate in dialogue? Absolutely. But we have to understand the culture of the environment we're operating in before jumping in and just assuming students are going to be ready and able to engage in these conversations. So again, one thing I've found is that having students collecting data uh, can help provide us with some interesting observations. So here, they've noted that of a lot of the student organizations, they I think they studied nine in total, um, none were effective at, at generating lots of likes and conversations on social media. They were often just shouting into the void about various events that were happening except for Turning Point USA, because they were inviting these controversial speakers on controversial topics. And it felt like a space, they perceived it felt like a space where people in agreement with them could feel safe in expressing their, uh, their attitudes and their opinions. Um, we had a great conversation in my class yesterday about this, about why those other groups didn't have more content uh, heavy social media conversations. And they concluded, again, this is observational research just with my students, um, that there's a certain level of fear of putting yourself out there as a student organization. Um, so they're not really engaging those kinds of conversations in social media. But let's talk about another option, uh, campus climate surveys. This is a lot of uh, research that we're seeing on campuses uh, right now. We're seeing um, Harvard Youth Poll just came out with their 42nd edition of campus climate. Uh, we obviously see Heterodox is, is leading the way with the Campus Expression Survey. The Listen First Project has its own uh, survey. FIRE has its own selection of items. Uh, for a researcher and someone in this field who's trying to do some evaluative research around civil discourse and dialogue on campuses, there's a lot of different uh, directions you can go. Um, so uh, we have been doing here at the University of Delaware what we call the Blue Hen Poll, that happens to be our mascot, the fighting blue hen. And uh, we've been doing this since I believe 2007, 2008, um, not every year consistently, but it's been part of a class. So students actually create the questions, they analyze the data. It's a fantastic opportunity for students. So again, 
I'm going to keep mentioning the, the importance of getting students involved in engaging in this research. So um, we have a lot of these uh, different organizations are interested in different types of outcomes. Listen First, for example, is very interested in affective polarization. Uh, Campus Expression Survey is very interested in controversial versus non-controversial topics in classrooms. So each, each poll has kind of its own flavor of, of items that are, are emphasized. But I want to talk to you about two very different studies that I, I uh, advised here that I was the PI for here at UD in the year 2022. Um, and uh, because it's 2022, two different studies for 2022. Um, and uh, it's December, it's 12, it's not 12, 22. Okay, that's all the 22s I can, I can say. Two different studies for 2022, um, our survey says. So we're gonna start with, uh, I'm actually gonna start with not our campus-wide survey, but the HXA flexible funding opportunity that I had over last fall and really collected most of the data in this, this last spring semester. So first off, we're talking about engaging beyond those campus-wide surveys. I'll get to them in a moment, but um, what I decided to do was do multiple on-campus events over the course of the semester. Uh, the post-test had a total of 606 respondents. Um, these were 606 hard-fought for respondents. Uh, it was very difficult to get students to participate, particularly last spring. It was kind of the first real semester that we were on, that we were all together, and there was just a, a real hesitation among students to get engaged. And I had three different treatments, uh, or two different treatments and a control. So I had students engage in, if you've been part of uh, Heterodox you, and have been to the conference, you probably have seen Kyle Emil and his free intelligent conversation signs. Uh, these are very short uh, passerby conversations where you just stand uh, in, um, a public area holding a sign that says free intelligent conversation and uh, just see who walks by and they provide some prompts, some interesting sort of, I, I'd call them intellectual icebreakers. So we had about 150 of those conversations, uh, total sample size of completed surveys there, 326. We also had what I called a tea time, uh, which was where I utilized the living room conversations. Uh, the topic that we chose for these living room conversations were what are American values and ideals? I wanted to select something that wasn't inherently partisan on one side or the other. Um, and we had about 37 of those conversations with somewhere between two and 12 participants each with a total of 99 uh, post-survey completes. And then we had our control condition, which uh, utilized a class um, of students uh, who needed extra credit. <laughs> um, so I was able to get a pretty large control who did not experience any of those kind of conversations. So basically we're talking about three levels here, an hour long-ish conversation that's, that's pretty direct and involved, a could be 30 second to two minute conversation or maybe even 15 minutes, um, and then a control condition with no conversation. So this is an example of some of my students uh, with holding the sign uh, of uh, free intelligent conversation um, using that living room conversations format. So let's look at what worked in, in this particular study. Um, first of all, again, I'm going to just mention that utilizing your students to engage with other students on campus is a great way to increase uh, uh, participation. So uh, free ICs, as they're called, I required them as a course assignment for 49 of my students, uh, 40, all 49 students in my media and politics class. And it turns out uh, students actually enjoy talking to other students. Um, so it's, it's great to utilize them rather than trying to utilize um, faculty or staff who may not be the most attractive conversationalists uh, when you're just out on campus holding a sign that says free intelligent conversation. So I required them to do at least three conversations each and uh, in these casual kind of quick conversations in public spaces on campus. And again, offering extra credit was an incredibly uh, useful way to, to get students to participate. This, I had to interact directly with us, with specific professors. Um, at UD, we have an online system called SONA, which other universities may have as well, which is basically creates a subject pool for participants in a department or in a college. So that's a great way to get students to participate. But if you don't have something like that, you really got to work on the ground with, with professors specifically to ask them 
if you can utilize their students. And then finally, I discovered that you really need to be where the students are. When we were uh, on the green, which is our main uh, sort of campus area uh, where students are walking to and from class and getting lunch, um, and if we had a set table set up, we had signs, we had balloons, we had uh, free Duncan didn't hurt, uh, hot cocoa and coffee on a cold day, uh, definitely drew students in. Um, but definitely being where they were, rather than asking them to come to a specific place at a specific time, was much more effective. Um, and honestly, it was effective to recruit them to come to those spaces at those times. Interacting with them in person on campus where they were at was a much better way than, say, mass emails or other ways of trying to recruit. So this is just a word cloud of some of the uh, comments that students had after they'd engaged in these various conversations, both the longer and shorter conversations. So you can see there's a lot of positive terms, respectful, interesting, thoughtful, good, nice, enjoy, uh, happy. Uh, so um, the overwhelming experience uh, just from a qualitative perspective has been very positive from engaging in these conversations. So let's start with some preliminary results from that UDEL Engage project. Again, this is one with the longer conversation, the shorter conversation compared to the control group. Um, and this is one of our mascots. Uh, uh, Baby Blue is the, the smaller blue hen. Um, and so we utilized uh, uh, the mascot to, to promote these events in uh, major student centers across the campus. So here, uh, Baby Blue is distributing some free popcorn to students. Popcorn was a big draw. I will share that piece. Smelling popcorn um, on, a, again, a sort of a chillier day is a great draw to like, okay, what are you doing here? Let's let's check this out. So let me give you some preliminary results for this. Then I'll go into the campus-wide survey. And then I want to talk about just some general strategies. So thank you again to Heterox for this uh, for funding this grant. Um, this, again, because this is a self-selected sample, had mostly sophomores and juniors, uh, freshmen and seniors were not as engaged, um, and mostly students in the College of Arts and Sciences. So as is typical, I think, on a lot of campuses, students in engineering and health sciences are a little bit removed from a lot of these conversations around politics and cultural issues. Uh, but business and economics is also a hard school for us to reach here at UD, so it was nice to see a 16.5% turnout uh, from them being engaged. Uh, so here it just shows you a breakdown of what our students look like that engage in these conversations. So again, this is a self-selected sample. These are students who chose to engage in these conversations. Um, a very liberal and liberal make up the majority of students who engage in the conversation. Uh, but we also see uh, students who are very moderate, which I think in some cases when we're doing this kind of research on college campuses, those moderate voices are often left out because they don't have the kind of extreme opinions on one side or the other that we're paying attention to. So I think it's really important that we draw those moderates into our samples. Uh, but then we also see a good a good share of conservatives and very conservative students. Um, but just so the, the audience is aware, the University of Delaware does lean liberal in terms of uh, the student body. So this isn't actually all that unrepresentative of students on our campus. Uh, in fact, uh, the University of Delaware um, has a total undergraduate uh, enrollment of about 8,671 as of last fall. Um, the gender distribution is 42% male and 58% female students. So across these different types of conversations, we saw a pretty representative sample of uh, male to female students. Um, and then we have also categories of, I prefer not to say, or non-binary. So it was nice to see that we had um, decent representation from, from different genders. However, as with many surveys and many activities on campus, we tend to see higher female participation than male participation. When it comes to race, and I apologize for all those jumbled up numbers there, but uh, just shows you how white our campus is. We are a predominantly white institution. Um, the university's current student population is 64 per, about 65% white. So in the UW engaged condition, we see 81% of those students were white. Uh, in the tea time, con or I'm sorry, the, yeah, the tea time condition, we saw that it was about 73% white. And for those who did not participate in a any conversation, it was almost 80%. So those numbers are not representative of the university as a whole. 
uh, if, again, the university's current student population is about 65% white, um, with about 6% black or saying they're black or African American, um, those numbers in particular for that intelligent conversation group are about half what they should be uh, compared to the actual composition of race on campus. So we have to think about self-selection and comfort level on a PDI or predominantly uh, white institution, PWI, um, in terms of which students are going to voluntarily engage in these kinds of conversations and which ones are we sort of fundamentally losing because it's a uh, difficult situation for them to edge themselves into. So let's look at some of the results specifically around some of the important dependent variables that I was interested in. So one of the first was uh, intention to engage in discussion with Anybody, I, this is actually three items. It was uh, in the next year, how willing would, be, would you be to do any of the following activities? Discuss politics with anyone, discuss politics with people who generally agree with you on po political and social issues, and discuss politics with people who generally disagree with you about politics and social issues. And in this case, we saw that people engaged in that hour long conversation were significantly more likely to engage in this kind of conversation compared to those who engaged in the short conversation or those in the control condition. Similarly, those who engage in the short conversations were significant, statistically significantly more likely to engage in these conversations than those who were in the control. So that's a win for me, um, seeing that engaging those conversations had an impact on their int behavioral intentions. I also measured uh, two traits, he, intellectual humility and intellectual curiosity. Um, I could spend a lot of time on talking about whether these are personality traits or states, as, in terms of whether they are movable or whether they are sort of uh, stable. But either way, um, I did look at intellectual humility. These are uh, items like, I question my own opinions, positions, and viewpoints because they could be wrong. Or in the face of conflicting evidence, I'm open to changing my opinions. All of these, by the way, are reliable scales. I would not include them if they did not uh, demonstrate reliability. We saw here a similar response that the longer conversations were statistically more students were significantly more likely to say that they engaged in these intellectual humility activities than the other conditions and the same with the shorter conversation versus the control. Intellectual curiosity, we didn't find the same thing here. We only saw a difference between uh, the longer conversations and the control condition. And these are questions like, I view challenging situations as an opportunity to grow and learn. I seek out situations where it is likely that I will have to think in depth about something. So curiosity provided some different results than, than humility. I'm gonna go over a few more items before we move over to the campus-wide survey. So one of my particular important variables of interest, dependent variables of interest is political participation, uh, whether that's measuring their past political particip participation or their participation intention. Since this was uh, conducted in the spring, of 2022, I wanted to examine what kinds of things they intended to do over the course of this midterm election year. So things like signing a petition, contacting an elected official, displaying a sticker or sign in support for a political campaign. So here we saw uh, similar results where we see the, the longer conversations have a statistically significant higher participation intention compared to the shorter conversations versus the control. We didn't see a, a, a difference between the free intelligent conversations and the control. When it came to perspective taking, this is an important uh, variable that uh, a lot of folks are looking at, examples of items in this scale. I sometimes find it difficult to see things from the other person's point of view, reverse coded. Uh, I try to look at everybody's side of a disagreement before I make a decision. Before criticizing somebody, I try to imagine how I would feel if I were in their place. Uh, so with perspective taking, we saw no significant differences. And what I'm preparing to argue uh, as I explore this further and continue data collection is whether this is demonstrative of more of a personality state rather than, uh, or, I'm sorry, more of a personality trait rather than a state. So something that is, is something that's sort of unchangeable. You're either a perspective taking person or you're not. Um, obviously continuing to do research on that area, no conclusive uh, ideas yet, but it's interesting that that's the only variable of these six primary dependent variables that showed no significant differences. Another variable I was very interested in was something called open-minded cognition. 
Uh, and this would be, so here again, another reverse coded item example. I often tune out political messages I disagree with, uh, or I believe it is a waste of time to pay attention to certain political ideas. Um, compared to when it comes to politics, I'm open to considering other viewpoints. Here we did see some significant differences between the UDEL engaged, the longer conversations versus the control group. Uh, and then in some additional findings, I'm not gonna uh, bore you with uh, big regression tables and ANOVA tables, um, but in some, some more predictive analyses using uh, ordinary squares regression, including control variables and other, um, other variables to sort of pit these variables against each other in predict predicting outcomes. We saw that political ideology was a significant predictor of intent to engage in political discussion, specifically those who identify as liberal or more likely to discuss politics with those who are ideologically different. That's a little different from other studies that we've seen where conservatives tend to be a little bit more willing to have those conversations. Uh, in this case, liberals also are more likely to indicate they were going to participate in politics. And interestingly, there are no real differences in demographics when looking at gender or race on either intended discussion or participation. Um, so I'm going to show this very briefly. People can pause this if they want to read this more in detail. But this was just a perspective that I wanted to share from one of my undergraduate researchers. In that picture, we actually see two of my graduate students and one of my undergraduate students. And uh, again, I think it's essential to talk to your students about what has this experience been like? What has worked? What hasn't worked? Make that part of the grade of their presentation or their assignment as they have to evaluate what worked and what di didn't because we need to hear from students on the ground what it's like to engage in this kind of research. So you can pause here if you wanna read that full statement, but basically uh, you need to have an undergraduate and graduate students to advise you on what's working and what's not. So let's move to the campus-wide survey. I'm, I'm aware of time here. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time. So I'm gonna give you some pr uh, preliminary results from the Blue Hen poll. These, ju I just came out like yesterday. My students just presented their research yesterday, uh, not even over, just over 24 hours ago. Um, so let's look a little bit at that. And this is, I'm delighted to say, I, I have a random sample of students across the university. And uh, if we look at um, the beauty of a random sample, look at this, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, other. Look at that. It's a perfect, like, random distribution of approximately the same number of students across those different um, age groups or, or school, school age groups. So I love the beauty of a random sample. Um, this is one of the things I'll talk about later in terms of limitations. Like it's great to do these interventions, but you don't really have a random sample. You've got an unbalanced number of people from different uh, backgrounds. So um, it's this is due in part because I have access to UD's Institutional Research and Effectiveness Office. Um, most universities have an office like this. It's often difficult to obtain random samples from them. I'm fortunate that because the Blue Hen Poll is a class, uh, students are required to do this for classwork, that I've been able to, every year since 2015, get these data. Um, so I have year over year comparisons. So let's look at uh, race. Um, again, we're looking at uh, largely white population, but this is much more closely representative of the university as a whole, given the statistics I provided earlier. Um, so let's look at a few specific items uh, around, uh, and again, I pulled these together rather quickly uh, because this, I just kind of got these results yesterday. Um, I've used a few items on an agree to disagree spectrum uh, about the first one, I believe UD is welcoming towards students of all political affiliations. And you'll see that liberal folks are in the blue columns, uh, conservative folks are in the pink and, or peach and uh, red columns and moderates are in the gray column. So we see that students who are more liberal believe that it's more welcoming. Um, we also see that uh, that when we look at a more, majority of students who associate with the same political party as me is relatively high among those extreme groups, most conservative and most liberal. And this is consistent with what we see, um, not just on college campuses, but broadly um, among people who, who they associate with. And we see here that uh, a larger number of conservatives seem to be part of a political group on campus. So that Talking Points USA group, for example, has drawn a lot of attention from students on campus. So that may be driving some of this uh, engagement. 
I also asked uh, students, had they ever been laughed at, put down, or overall made fun, made uncomfortable for sharing their political views, consistent with when we see heterodox surveys and other campus surveys, conservative students are more likely to say that they've experienced this than liberal students. This is a similar finding here with question number five, whether it's acceptable for professors to integrate their political beliefs into their teaching, uh, conservatives being less likely to say so than liberals. And conservative students also saying they feel that professors integrate their political beliefs into their teaching. Um, so not whether it's acceptable, but whether they actually do that. Um, so there are differences between conservatives and liberals. I asked these same questions in the 2021 Blue Hen poll. Interestingly, the differences this year are slightly smaller than last year's numbers. I have not done a statistical analysis of whether those are statistically significant, but I've noticed that the students are coming a little bit closer together um, in 2022 compared to 2021. Uh, so let's look at uh, a comfort level in um, engaging with, uh, with other students in the classroom, with friends, um, and having a conversation about politically controversial issues. So again, we see kind of a consistent pattern here where liberal students are more comfortable sharing their political views in the classroom with their friends and with those who have opposing viewpoints to their own. Um, and when we look at, kind of break this down more specifically, how comfortable would you feel about speaking up and giving your views on a controversial political topic in a UD class? Nearly 80% of Republicans say they're somewhat or very reluctant compared to just about 60% of Democrats who say they're somewhat or very comfortable and 61% of independents who are somewhat or very reluctant. And then you see I've got a something else category there as well, but they tend to fall along the same lines as independents for the most part. Following up on those issues uh, about speaking about a controversial issue, uh, in these, this question wording comes from the HXA Campus Climate Survey. I've um, generalize it a little bit. The campus climate survey from HXA specifies issues around politics, uh, gender identity. I think there are like seven or eight different topics. Um, but if you're someone who writes surveys, you often have to be aware of how much time you're asking people to commit um, their efforts to. So uh, I just asked if you speak up on any controversial issue, how concerned would you be that your professor would criticize your views? Again, we see very consistent results here with Republicans being more likely to say they're concerned than Democrats or independents or something else. Similar uh, results in terms of looking at how other students would criticize your views. Uh, Republicans increasingly concerned compared to Democrats or uh, independents. Actually, independents look a lot more like uh, Republicans in this situation than, than anyone else. And then when we ask if they've found people at the University of Delaware who support their political beliefs, uh, 2% of Democrats somewhat or strongly disagree that they've found someone um, it, compared to 15% of Republicans who disagree. So Republicans are, are more likely to say that they have not found people who support their political beliefs. Uh, and independents, again, falling kind of in the, in the closer to Republicans, but a little bit lower. And then uh, again, speaking about those controversial speakers that have come to campus, uh, we have really diverse per perspectives from Republicans and Democrats um, compared to whether the university should allow these speakers. I mentioned there were protests uh, of these controversial uh, conservative speakers. So 8% of Democrats somewhat or strongly agree that uh, the university should allow controversial speakers compared to 33% of Republicans and 21% of, of independents. So Democrat and Republican students on college campuses are having very different perceptions uh, around controversial speakers uh, and extremist groups speaking on campus. And I don't think that's isolated to UD. Uh, let's look uh, finally at um, confidence in sharing their political beliefs broadly. 13% of Democrats disagree or somewhat disagree with this statement compared to 47% of Republicans and 37% of independents. So this is that again, a, a relatively liberal institution on the East Coast um, with students largely coming from the states of New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, uh, New York, and Maryland. Um, so we do have Republicans and independents reporting similarly to what we've seen in other HXA studies um, that they don't feel comfortable or confident in sharing their beliefs. Now, when I was at HXA conference in uh, back in June, there was a great study 
uh, presented that did an in-depth qualitative analysis of, of interviews with conservative students who had stated that they felt uncomfortable or not confident in sharing their views. And in these interviews, uh, the researcher at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln found that the students were actually unable to come up with specific examples or instances where they could not have expressed their views or felt uncomfortable expressing their views. So this is, as I will, I will talk about limitations, this is a limitation of survey research like this is that we don't really know, did those Republicans and independents have specific examples or experiences uh, that they could share? Or is this perhaps emblematic of a larger narrative around uh, perceptions that Republicans don't have a say in the classrooms uh, with or with faculty? Um, so that's kind of wrapping up some of the, the main findings. Again, these are fresh off the press, um, just uh, coming out. That I haven't shared these data with anyone yet, so these are new to you. I hope you found them interesting. Um, I do want to share what I'm doing moving forward before I kind of talk about some limitations. Um, I'm excited to be part of a larger uh, grant from the John Templeton Foundation through Braver Angels, ACTA, and Bridge USA. Uh, around building a community of intellectual humility and discourse in higher education. This uh, grant uh, from Christian universities to military, Virginia Military Institute to community colleges uh, across the university. So we have faculty partners at each of these universities are going to help us create these uh, debates. I'm going to move to the next slide to give you an example debates uh, that are of the Braver Angels College Dialogue and Discourse Project. Um, for example, we had a debate here at University of Delaware about Greek life. Should Greek life organizations be eliminated from UD's campus? And you can imagine on a campus that, that you, Greek life is important to a, a large uh, portion of students. This brought out a lot of students um, who were in, really engaged in this conversation. So uh, in addition to engaging students in kind of the back end research around what's happening on college campuses, I highly encourage you to engage them in the front end. Do a survey. What topics would you want to debate at UD? Um, and so we did this. We had a, a sample of students ask answer questions about which topics they'd be most interesting and interested in debating. This one showed up at the top. And here's uh, just a picture of, I think we had about 60 students show up, which Again, having gone through the excruciating process of trying to get students to participate in conversations last spring, this was actually a really high turnout uh, for, for an event like this. Students, uh, I can talk about the format a little bit later, but if you're interested, but the students have to give sort of opening statements and then it's open to students to ask questions or engage in conversation. Um, I did another uh, conversation like this in my classroom. Apologies for my terrible chalkboard handwriting, uh, but my students decided on the, the, the debate, is cancel culture accountability? In other words, does cancel culture actually work? Uh, and this was fascinating for me. Um, both of these conversations are fascinating because we actually got into the nuance of a lot of, 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 it wasn't just like, are you pro or con this? Are you for or against this? It was really nuanced, interesting conversation that everyone came away with a different perspective. And one of the things that I that we happens at these Braver Angels uh, ACTA uh, Bridge USA debates is we sort of have like a quick lightning round at the end, like what, what did you like about this conversation? And a lot of students are just like, when can we do this again? When is the next one? Um, I think that they're really interested in engaging these kinds of dialogues. So this is the, the smaller classroom discussion that we had. So let's, I'm gonna kind of wrap up here in the next couple of slides. I appreciate your time. Uh, the bottom line, when you're thinking about recruiting students to engage in dialogue on ca college campuses, and particularly if you're interested in doing research and evaluating the impact of those things, I'm gonna give a few pointers, is you need to choose your sampling method wisely. So apologies for geeking out on uh, methods here for a minute, but um, whether you have a probability versus a non-probability sample matters. So um, if you want to gauge whether students in, engaging in a debate is if impactful, you have to kind of allow yourself to, to deal with a non-probability sample. These students are going to self-select into these groups. If you want a campus climate survey 
you need to be talking to those, institu those um, institutional research organizations at your university to see how and if you can obtain a completely random sample of students. They have two different purposes. You have to really do a cost benefit analysis. Um, with a non probability sample, you have a greater chance for bias, again, self selection. Uh, and it doesn't allow you to calculate uh, sampling error, which you can do with a, a probability sample. So a lot of people say, well, why on earth would you choose to do a non probability sample? Well, you could examine a new variable phenomenon. You could, if it's you're doing something where it's difficult to find participants, uh, or if it's a sensitive subject matter, and it's also efficient and cost productive. So any research method is going to have its ups and its downs, and you need to kind of persuasively convince your audience for why you've chosen the methods that you have. Uh, so intervention type, um, whether this is an experiment uh, or a survey. So uh, I would say that that my my conversations with my students that I presented earlier was much more of an experimental method. Um, I didn't sh share with you some pretest results, but I had a pretest with some of the students, then had the conversation, then did post test. Um, so that's the experimental methods are 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 great. They um, they allow you to uh, to ex assess the impact of people who engaged in a certain activity and people who did not. However, they have problems in terms of generalizability. Um, you can't say that that these things in generalize to all people. They because again, those samples are not randomly selected. Um, there's also issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in terms of self-selected samples, as I've mentioned, and uh, not representing the population as a whole. So these are issues you have to think about in terms of recruiting students. Um, who do you go to to try and increase the number of students from those backgrounds that tend to underperform or under, under uh, not show up <laughs> to these studies compared to your more uh, white female student population that tends to show up more, at least at UD. Um, again, I talked about experimental designs uh, versus surveys. Um, I talked about some problems with experiments, but with surveys, uh, you can't really monitor participants uh, as they're going through a survey. There's a phenomenon in survey research uh, that's called satisficing, where we know students and people in general will just kind of go through and say, agree, 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 agree. And it's hard to control for that. You can measure certainly the time that they spend on the survey and try to look for anomalies uh, where things don't fit, but it's it's something you have to do on the back end. You can't really control that at the beginning. And then a lot of times with, with surveys and experiments, you have to deal with incentives and buy-in. I could spend a lot of time talking about uh, the problems with incentives. Um, they don't always work is the bottom line, uh, no matter how, how attractive they are. And then um, understanding how to navigate uh, IRBs and uh, offices of institutional research. Uh, so in, internal uh, review boards and offices of institutional research. If you don't know what these are, I'm happy to answer questions um, at the end. Basically, these are institutions within a university where you have to demonstrate to them why your study is an appropriate study on human subjects. Um, so for IRBs, it's really important to think about, uh, oops, uh, to think about uh, anonymity, privacy and confidentiality. Those are the three pillars for IRBs. Um, and I'm happy to announce, literally six hours ago, I believe, I just got my exempt evaluation from University of Delaware's IRB for the study that I just described to you uh, from Braver Angels, ACTA, and Bridge USA from the Don John Templeton Foundation. So you're hearing it first. Here we have um, uh, been approved to move forward with this research. Um, it was uh, a bit of an ordeal. Uh, it had to change a few things along the way, but you have to be willing to work with your IRB. And, uh, and if you are working with an office, office of institutional research, um, you have to be willing to be open to their viewpoints and not be sort of indignant about, I wanna do this research and this is why I need to do it. Um, really learn how to, to navigate these institutional resources. So I'll wrap things up there and I'm really curious uh, about your questions as well as any observations from your campuses or from studies that you've done. Great, thanks so much, Lindsay. Uh, so much good work happening at 
You do. We appreciate you sharing uh, a lot of the ins and outs of, of the work you're doing. Um, as Lindsay says, we are now going to turn to a time of Q&A and conclude the recorded portion of this evening. Uh, for those watching the recording later, thanks so much for checking us out. We warmly invite you to attend a live event soon and join the conversation. Thank you.